All right, so our philosophy for power control now. So what we've implemented in 2006 and on and keep doing is digital predictive control, OK? Why? Well, digital is very interesting because, as I, as I put there, one op amp costs 10 cents, and one gate costs a micro cent, a micro dollar, right? <laughs> it's a new unit. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so there is a clear advantage to digital control because you can do far more complicated stuff and far more versatile stuff than you can with analog processing. I'm an analog engineer. I, it's what I do. Um, but but you know, digital control is vastly superior for most applications. The other piece of good news is that if you do, if you can do that in a totally digital way, it's totally repeatable, and the IP is very secure. You know, when you bury your IP into an ASIC or custom chip, it's very hard to actually go figure out what's going on in there. So we have been investing a lot of money into into ASIC development, and we have a team in Santa Clara that does all our ASICs for us. Predictive control is something which is very rare. Uh, you rarely, rarely see this type of control in any kind of power electronics. And we've done that now for 3 million units, so we know it pretty well. Um, it has major advantages. Uh, so when I say predictive control, here's what it means. Uh, on normal inverters, you usually, because your output product is a current, you always have a current sense on the output. That measures the current you're actually producing, and then it goes back into the PWM or circuit like a PWM that con with, a, with a feedback loop that controls that the output current is what you want it to be. We don't do that. We, we don't have any current sense on the output. What we do is that we anticipate how the hardware should be driven to get the exact right current in all circumstances. So it's, that's what I mean by perspective, is that we, we just know what to do <laughs> with that, with that Knowing exactly what's happening, we know what to do. You know, uh -huh. So what are my parameters? I have, an, I have a DC voltage at a given time, right? I do this process very fast. So it's on a microsecond level, if you wish. Okay? So at a microsecond level, I say, what is my DC voltage, instantaneous DC voltage? What is the voltage on the grid at that given time? Is it 200 volt, 220 volt, whatever, right? And the last input is, what current do I want to put out? Okay, so if I want to put 0.8 amps, I have, two, let's say, 30 volt in, 220 volt out, 0.8 amps at the microsecond level. Okay, I compute what I need to do to get that, to get the right current in those circumstances, and I just do it. We do control of the of the D cycle, if you wish, or of the of the switches of the power train. Every cycle, it's a new thing. Okay, and it's all computed right there. So it's much, much faster processing that if you have feedback, you're just averaging that for a much longer time, right? And, and you kind of say, well, I'm too low, so I need to go up, and I'm too high, I need to go down, and it takes a, it takes a while, right? So the great news about this is that, and that's one of my last dots here, is that it's, it's basically inherently stable. You don't have to worry about what the load actually is. You don't care what the load is. All you, all, all, you, all you know is what my output voltage, what my input voltage, and what current do I want. Okay, It's totally independent from what's out there. Uh, on, on a regular inverter, when you have a feedback system and you have a filtering inductor in the output, you could run in pretty tough problems depending on the, on the impedance that's on across the line. Okay, That could totally change the the you know the, uh, the, 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 the influence of your output filter in, in, into the feedback loop, right? You need I so in order to be stable in all conditions, you need to be much lower than you would be, or you know much more damped than you would be normally. In this case, I don't have that problem. I can just do it microsecond by microsecond. Okay? It's basically a feed-forward system, right? Open well, it's open loop, and and you know I do the right thing. I. Uh, you know, y your powertrain behaves like you can model your powertrain. If you reverse that model, you can figure out what how to drive it to get the right answer, right? But in order to do this, you need a really, really intimate knowledge of what's going on in there. So, so in order to got, get that, that control right, 
we need to account for every little piece, tidbits, and, you know, nitty gritty of everything in there. But you know what? That's actually got good properties. N knowing what you do is actually a good thing. <laughs> so, so it allows us to create very accurate model of the, of the system of powertrain and be able to actually optimize the powertrain to get the best efficiency. Right? Because we have this very, ac very accurate, very intricate model of the system, we can actually use that to our ad advantage. Right? So it's actually a very good thing. Um, so again, this allow for, uh, for maximum efficiency. We have minimal cost. You know, as I said, you know, our, our custom very complex chip cost us basically one dollar. If you start putting, you know, either DSPs or, or analog control systems, you'll go way beyond that much faster. Okay, so it's it's very good cost wise. Another good point is that because we do control system at microsecond level, we also know at microsecond level when things go bad. <laughs> when things go bad, we react very fast. So um, if you have, you know, bizarre behavior, you know, things don't match your model, we see that immediately and we can stop things before, before things go really bad. So, <laughs> good question. So that's exactly the question I had when we started this endeavor because I had no idea if that was necessary or not. It turns out that if you pick the right lever in the hardware, lever could be anything. It could be a peak current control. It could be uh, a duty cycle control. If you pick the right one, you can avoid major sensitivity to the, to the hardware. So no, we don't. We have some calibration from unit to unit, but it's more like accuracy of voltage measurement, stuff like this. We 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 don't have any calibration of powertrain on a unit by unit basis. We don't need to. That's the beauty of it. Now it's not easy to do this, and it doesn't work with every powertrain either. But uh, at least you, you have to have very significant difference in your lever <laughs> to control the system uh, uh, to, to 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 get that right. Um, if you pick. I'll give you an example. If you if you had a resin power uh, powertrain, you know LLC LC resin uh, converter, and you should try to pick the frequency as a lever, you'll be in really bad shape. Let's put it this way. Um, so um, I know we tried. <laughs> so um, so you have to find the right lever. That's a, that's a critical item to this. Okay. So very good uh, protection to, uh, towards you know, adverse uh, elements. Uh, it's inherently stable. And, um, and the powertrain is actually not that important. So our powertrain is based on a flyback converter. We managed to extract 96, 97% of our flyback. Um, when we started, it was kind of a real wild bet. If you, if you look at your textbook, most of what I see is say flyback, low efficiency. It's not true. You can do high efficiency converter with anything. If you account for it, if you optimize it right, if you know how to handle it, you can get high efficiency with anything. So the question is not that. The question is, what is the minimum cost for the highest efficiency? <laughs> that is the question. All right? So here's a unit we have. Um, DC, uh, DC current comes in on the left-hand side. AC current goes on the outside, on the, on the right-hand side. The two transformers there are the flyback booster shapers. Okay, um, they are uh, it's two interleaved flybacks, so we have two stages running in tandem, being properly interleaved when we need to. So capacitors that are required for storage are on the left-hand side. Um, on the top, you see our ASIC. Um, on the top right hand side, you see um, transformers, which one of which is used for power line communication, for instance. On the bottom right hand corner, you have the uh, chain which does the filter, uh, the filter EMC filter for AC, uh, for the AC port. Okay, this box is pretty small. Uh, it looks simple, it's not. The whole difficulty is actually to make it look simple. <laughs> OK? So supervision now. So beyond power conversion, we need to control the power conversion um, 
So we need to do grid synchronization. So PLL that locks up to the grid voltage and frequency. You need to handle voltage and current limits. You need to do reverse voltage protection on DC port if some, somebody reverse wire. It's pretty hard to do, but people can do it. Um, you know, we need to monitor voltage and currents on both ports, AC and DC. We need to monitor and manage temperature. So if, if you run, if you put this stuff in an oven, we won't let the unit self-destruct by running at full power no matter what. So we start pushing down power when we get really hot. We need to gather energy production and ship them out. So good news on a, on a renewable energy inverter is that you, it's, it's OK to shut down for a short period of time if you think there is something wrong. So, so we do that. We, we take advantage of that. If I was a, a computer supplier, I could not do that. But as a, as a renewable energy producer, producer, I can actually do that. I can shut down if we have a real issue. It's not like it happens all the time. It doesn't. But it's better to stop and figure out what's going on rather than trying to keep going. You know. All right, so power conversion efficiency. So that's critical item, which directly affects, affects uh, the harvest. Uh, so there is a harvest uh, aspect which is very important, but the other big problem is inefficient are basically heat, therefore lack of reliability. So in order to reduce the power dissipation unit, it's great to have a good efficiency. It's inter we're, so we're, our, our product is running a 96% average. Um, and I can't recall the last time a customer of ours asked us to get better efficiency. It's not really a market requirement anymore. I want to get higher efficiency because it can reduce the box, the, the size of the box, and that's cost. Right? So that's what drives it at this point. So peak power dissipation is now more important than the uh, average efficiency to me. So here's a curve that is on the so the California Energy Commission has a test that is used uh, to make sure that the inverters are efficient, and everybody uses this at least in the U.S. Um, and here's what I picked directly from our from the CC website. So you can see here that the efficiency curve is extremely flat. It goes basically from 94 in the worst case at low power to to 96 percent in most cases. Okay. So what is the environment we are at? Well, we're at door. It's an outdoor product. Uh, seen the humidity, rain, whatever. You name it, frost, snow, anything. Um, we are below the module in most cases, but not always. Some people decide to put it you know, in the middle of the roof or something. It's bizarre, but people do that. Uh, we designed a product to work on an ambient temperature of minus 40 to plus 65, which is pretty wide range. Even though we actually know what the internal unit is, and we never get to 65 ambient. It's never happened, I think. Except in one case, somebody put it actually in the attic in a really confined space. But very weird installation. But um, in regular installations, it's never a problem. Of course, at 65 C ambient inside is running much hotter, but you know, 85, 95, no, nothing terribly bad. All right, packaging. So that's actually a big problem. How to how to design the box um, so that it it's it survives elements. Um, it has to be corrosion resistant. Uh, it's got a pretty tough job that box, the little box. Yeah, you have to resist corrosion, you have to cool electronics, you have to protect electronics from water ingress or even moisture ingress. You have to protect electronics from mechanical damages. The installers typically throw the stuff on the roof, so it's not an easy life. Um, you have to contain electromagnetic signal for inside, if possible. <coughs> and you have to be as small as possible, as, as, as cheap as possible, and easy to manufacture. So it's actually a very difficult job to do for that box. And last but not least, we have to do that for 25 years, because we have a 25-year warranty on the product. So it is, when you add up all that stuff together, it's, it's pretty difficult. Power line communication. So um, when we, again, when we started this project, I thought I should be able to buy a chip on the marketplace that will allow us to have communication from the inverter to the gateway. 
And so we put something in, and we tried out it. One unit on my roof worked fine, and two, it's OK. And then we put six units, and it started falling apart. So at some point, we had to stop everything we are doing and just do a power line communication system from scratch, because we simply couldn't find anything that worked. So we spent a huge amount of time on that and the effort. But um, we have our own technology now that is far more robust than anything you can find out there. Um, so with this, we report data to the gateway. And we also allow the gateway to control the number if, if we need to. So we can upgrade units, do debugging, all these type of features. This transmission system is narrow band. We use uh, a carrier on 140 kilohertz, depending on the country, on 20 to 140 kilohertz. And it's a frequency modulation. Uh, so it's tr transmitted <coughs> one volt signal, basically is transmitted over the grid voltage. It's a point to multipoint system. Um, it has to be very robust. Uh, the, the environment in, uh, on the grid, as, as a matter of noise, is drastically bad. It's horrendous, actually. So you look, you put a scope not directly across the grid. You shouldn't do that. But through a transformer or any other s coupling, safe coupling system. And, and you'll see horrible noise floors. You'll see spikes, gigantic spikes, 20 volts, 30 volts. It's it's very difficult, very challenging system to, to, to transmit onto. After 20 years of telecom, this is by far the worst medium I've ever worked with. Um, so it's a very difficult problem to do, to, to solve, especially with the cost and power requirement that you have to live with. Okay.